morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Has, has Michelle, no, ah, someone is sitting on a bean. Congratulations. <laughs> I did the bean. We're going to help with it. My name is Don Brzezinski. I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at Southern New Hampshire University. And uh, my role right now is just to welcome everybody here. How many people, this is this is our eighth year of business uh, indicators. So how many of you have been to these in the past? Actually, how many of you are new? All right, more important question. How many of you are new to the sandbox? How many of you have never been here before? Well, welcome to this experience as well. We're in a great space, uh, and today's program is having Michelle uh, is, uh, walk you through and tell you a good deal about it, so we're excited uh, for that. Uh, as part of my introductory comments, of course, I want to thank our sponsors uh, for this. Uh, Mike, we're, Mike Leckweir, and uh, thank you for the sponsorship of, of, of this um, uh, the series uh, with Jersey and uh, also uh, the Letty Group out on the coast uh, does our, our sponsorship out there as, as well. Uh, so um, so we do appreciate Bell Weather and Letty Group and everybody that supports uh, supports this, this series. Uh, I was saying to a couple of people earlier, and they cringed a bit, I was like, I think I sense falling there. <laughs> and, 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 I think we in New Hampshire, Paul's like that. He's like, ah, that means that means winner's next. And uh, but my analogy I was sharing with a few is that on a college campus, for those of you that are baseball fans, this reminds me of opening day. Because no matter how bad your team was growing up with the Sox in the '70s, you're jaded through all of the year. But opening day is fresh and it's new. And it's the same on a college campus. So, you know, my experience in, in higher ed, uh, what, what we're about to go into is the most exciting part of the year because everybody has a 4 0 and everybody's <laughs> right? And everybody loves their teachers. So it's, and the teachers love all their students. So it's a, it's a, it's a really. And the teams are in first place, too. Yeah. And our team, yes, and our teams are all in first place. So it's, it's a great time of the year. So, uh, so welcome. Those are my welcome remarks. What I want to do now is just uh, uh, introduce uh, Paul, President LeBlanc, uh, uh, who's going to say uh, a few words about uh, where the university's been, where, where, what our future holds for us, and whatever else he wants to tell you about. Something. So, thank you, Paul. Thank you. So, uh, I don't know if he knows about opening day, but there's still every year as a guy at the Cubs game, opening day for the Cubs, who shows up with a sign that says, as always, next year. Yeah. <laughs> and the Cubs is like the first game of the season. This <laughs> is a wonderful and complete fatalism. Um, the, um, so, uh, I'm going to open, I just want to give you a little bit of an overview. A couple of you have seen this. I'm looking at Mike, Patricia, who are here for another event, so forgive me that you've seen some of these slides. But it tickles me that uh, Ed and Ann Shapiro are here because I'm going to open with. Uh, but this slide. Um, so, in fact, in 1932. Introduce Mr. Shapiro. Like, does everyone know? Uh, maybe you don't. It's like, I forget so you know what you know. But uh, Ed and Ann were the, are the children of uh, the founders of what was then. Well, Ed, New Hampshire School of Accounting and Commerce, was that, was that the very first name? No. It was not. It was the later name. I thought so. This is my favorite part of this, is that we went to New Hampshire College, we couldn't quite afford to change the sign, so we just added the one down here. <laughs> we cover all of our bases with, like, dual branding. <laughs> yeah, we got you, you're lucky. This is easier to change than this, but this is uh, on Hanover Street, of course, next to the Palace Theater, and this is where the Palace's offices are today. Um, so you think about 1932, and I, don't, I wonder what the size of the very first class was. Seven students. Seven students. Two classrooms. Two rooms. Perfect, right? So then you go to this, um, and today more than 85,000 students across the country um, from about 60 countries actually as well. Online, of course, is the large driver of this. This is our new library of learning commons if you haven't had a chance. Um, it's a beautiful building that people really love. And I think we, yeah, so these are some just great aerial shots we found of the campus. Um, so, and we moved to that space in the north end of Manchester in 1967, 68, somewhere around there. I think the campus opened. Where did it? Yeah. It had to be after. Mike, when were, when were you there? Uh, I was over there in 2007. So. <laughs> <laughs> it started in 2002. It's fine though, we do bring some alums. We bring alums back to the original campus. It had camp. to be after 69 because I did not work on the new campus when okay, I left so. in 69. Right on 6970, we're moving first. But we just take a look at sort of the growth uh, over time. 
um, now in 2011, 2015, and right now we have two, you know, four major projects going on. If you haven't been through campus, this is the new library. We have the Gustafson Center um, going here, which will house admissions and career center. And the message we want to send there is that the day you walk on the campus to talk about being a student, we'll start the conversation with you about your job and your career, right? Those things have to be linked now. You don't wait till your senior year anymore, not, not post the session. Uh, major renovation of the old Shapiro Library into a student center. Back here, new $35 million dormitory, uh, Victory Lane, um, a brand new athletic complex, which will be a stadium, more playing fields, uh, track and field, eight lane track, eight tennis courts, and more. So, oh, will that be the place? What's there? Nope, it's an addition. Uh, we have uh, expanded sports, we've expanded our women's sports, especially. Um, uh, part of that is Title IX, part of that's just the success of our program, and, you know, for all the right reasons. Um, probably never been more successful in athletics than we have been these last three years of the 16 sports in which we compete. Chrissy, do you remember how many championships we won? Like a third of them, I think, were right, the, I, there are I mean, new I mean, champions. I want to say 90% of the teams have gone to playoffs. The tournament, the right. Yeah. Um, and then addition, of course, we have uh, nearing 500 people in this building. We're renovating the second floor, so we'll have most of this building. Another 1,400 people down at the mill, um, so we continue to expand. Bit of an issue actually with unemployment rate below three percent in the state, we're really struggling now. Um, yeah. And if it's three percent in total, we're hiring people with college degrees. It's even this, you know, it's even lower. Oh yeah, so these are this is the Gustav Center, which is a really cool building. Same people who designed the library. It's supposed to be evocative in its lines of uh, a sort of New England barn kind of uh, mass. Of thing. It's a little stretch, but that looks like chicken. <laughs> um, so you sort of see the space expansion over time. Um, employee growth has been enormous. Um, I think if we just rolled it back five years, we were probably around 2,000 employees. So there are some Mondays, people here who worked on the mill will tell you there are some Mondays when HR is onboarding 40 new full-time people at a time. And that's the problem I was just alluding to, but it's a good problem. Um, and that I think in the time, you know, during the recession, we were one of the best employment stories in Manchester itself. And had a lot to do, I think. Um, let's just say this. There are oftentimes they go into the bridge on a weekend and they don't charge me. Um, <laughs> because they're just, they're killing it with their sort of uh, food deliveries. Like, no, 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 you, you eat for free. We got, uh, <laughs> when I see all sort of bridge deliveries happening, Bridge Street Cafe happening. So th this is a, a really good part of the story, I think, too. It's actually interesting. I've had this conversation. I think Manchester in 1880, was really a center for innovation and technology. We don't think of the industrial age quite in that way, but this was the largest mill complex in the world at the time. Um, and people came from around the world. I would argue that if you, the story we're not telling very well about Manchester today is it sort of returned to that. The, if you look at the companies, Dime, DECA, the work we do, even though we're in education, it's really so much technology driven, a lot of the new companies. I mean, there's a really great innovation story here that I don't think we're telling as well as we should. Um, student growth I've mentioned already. So this starts in 2009, and this is our enrollments. Um, it was in 2009 that we set out to really build a national brand. I don't know if you can see this, but I have uh, colleagues, presidents at other schools in other parts of the country who have seen this and said it looks like a plague. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's how they feel about us in terms of uh, the competition. So that takes us up to last March, but it's really dramatic when you see it that way, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. Um, so three years ago, we had one graduation. Then we went to two last year. We had four graduations over two days, and I don't know what the hell we're going to do this coming May. Um, so we have a <laughs> meeting later this week to talk about December graduations, regional graduations on the West Coast, for example. But we will. Last year we graduated 16,000 students. This year we'll graduate closer to 20,000 students. So the alumni base is growing exponentially. And what's really great about that, of course, is the value-added network that we're creating. So when we do alumni events, we have one coming up, two coming up in LA and one in San Francisco. It's great to see online students, graduates from the traditional campus, now graduates from College for America. They don't think of themselves as having tremendously different experiences. They only know the SNHU they know. They're really proud of that, and they're exchanging business cards. And you see you know, a young, recent graduate from the campus talking to somebody who works online in a tech company, saying, hey, I'd love to work here. Oh, come see me next week, blah, blah, blah. And there's that kind of value-added networking connection that's really important, I think. Um, and it's, a, it's an increasingly important part of our story. 
internationally we've talked about, um, I think this number, uh, this is not the number we came up with, this is independently sort of verified number from NASA, which is the big national association for foreign students. Huge impact on the local community. Um, and if you drive through campus parking lots, you'll notice that almost all of the really good cars are driven by our international students. <laughs> There's actually um, the BMW 7 Series, brand new, beautiful car, blacked out windows, and I was walking to the gym, I was like, the car rolls yeah. down. It's like one of our graduate students, like, why are you driving? I'm driving a Super. What are you doing driving the BMW 7 Series? <laughs> Let me pray him. Um, alumni base, so growing very, very fast. And these numbers are now picking up uh, speed. Community service, I think, and community giving, we're very proud. Um, I think we're in the top 10 donors for United Way now. Um, generous uh, employees and lots of engagement. Our uh, Center for Campus and Student Engagement, Community Engagement, is the largest single student organization on the main campus. So we're sending people out all over town every day. And then we're also sending them on alternative spring breaks to the Dominican Republic, to the Gulf after Katrina. I'll probably be back to these in and do these stories. Uh, partnerships, increasingly important part of our story. Um, these are great. We open up technology classrooms at the Celtics. We do two a year in inner city schools of uh, marginalized neighborhoods. We're the higher ed partner for Major League Soccer. This is a big deal for us. This is a multi year deal. Um, so, in every one of the 20 cities where there is a team, we build an inner city uh, soccer pitch, a mini pitch with Adidas and Major League Soccer. So, I've, we've done this in Newark, we've done it at Roxbury, Mass., we've done it in LA, I was up there for that one. We also do scholarships for people who have been engaged with the community there. It's an incredibly moving thing uh, in places of very high need. Uh, this is Michelle, may you say a little bit more about this? I'll introduce her a bit. It's one of the coding boot camps that you've heard so much about. Doing really good work with these guys out of New York. WPI, we're doing a master's degree in engineering management. So, um, as we become bigger, as our footprint has become bigger, as we become known as a leader in innovation um, and in online learning, a lot of these partners, particularly in the education space, uh, want to work with us. So, we do a master's in music uh, industry management with Berkeley School of Music, for example. Um, not a big program, but just a really high quality, terrific program. It also helps lift our brand, so it's, it's both, right? It works in a number of ways. Um, lots of coverage. Um, do we have the, yeah. Um, US News World Report this past year for the first time listed innovation as one of its categories. We were number one in the Northeast. Oh, right, it should have been a nation, but that's okay. Um, and then in just a couple of weeks, we'll be renaming the Verizon, the uh, SNG Arena. I was arguing for the Snooper Dome, but that one lost. <laughs> No, it is getting local traction. I've heard people talk about the Snooper Dome. Uh -huh. So there's the naming, which is great. And everyone sort of goes to that because it's the obvious and obvious and the visible. Um, I think almost as important to me is the fact that we get to place internships in sports management, not only in that arena, but also the 210 other properties that SMG manages around this country. We get to, in the concourses, open up and have tables around financial aid counseling. So if you have an event that's going to have, that's likely to have families and teenagers, we get to have that conversation with them. So in lots of ways, we will extend uh, that relationship. But it's also a good, um, I think, reaffirmation of our local support. Even though we built a national brand, we're very much a Manchester institution, proud of where we are, and committed to the same as well. So that's a 10-year, 10 or 11-year deal. Um, we haven't talked about College for America, which is our competency-based program. We built a technology platform for it because we couldn't find one in existence that worked for this new mode of thinking about education, really a breakthrough. We were the first program of that kind uh, approved by the U.S. Department of Ed back in 2013. When we built that platform, we had so many other schools asking about it, we thought there was an opportunity to monetize it. So we spun off uh, as the first time we've ever done a for-profit subsidiary. So Motivus Learning is based on Salem. It's got 44 employees. The university has provided a second round of funding. The next round of funding will probably go outside and look for equity investors. Uh, they just um, did their soft release of their first commercial product, what we have been using with the internet with crazy product. Um, they're off and running. So uh, really excited about the possibilities here. Great board of uh, that come together for that. College for America is the one I mentioned. Uh, it's a competency-based program, no courses, no credit hours. Everything is about competency. The skills you need to be successful in the workplace. It's B2B only, so we work with some of those companies you see in the background. I think notably last fall, 
about this time, just a year ago, um, Anthem Insurance um, adopted it as its free college option for all 55,000 of their employees. About 35,000 of them have no college degrees. So if you're an Anthem employee, you don't have a degree, you enroll in College for America, you have no cost, and you work your way through as fast or as slow as you need to. Really just a terrific program with a real pay setter. A uh, program I'm really proud of, we are in Rwanda with College for America. Uh, in Kigali, and we use that as a springboard to open up in the Kibiza refugee camp. So this is a refugee camp that goes back to the genocide. 20,000 people have been living there. The students in this program have known no other place. It is one of the most searingly painful, depressing places I've ever spent time in. Um, so we have our second cohort of students with uh, help from the IKEA Foundation. We have a full-time staff member, a brilliant young woman, Nina Weaver from Oxford, who we hired. And she's living at the camp, really building the evidence base and the structure so that we can scale this up. And um, we're in conversations with others about how to do that uh, because it's an enormous, massive need, as you know. More refugees in the world today than any time since the end of World War II. Sandbox. So Michelle and I, and just Michelle Weiss, who we were able to steal away from the Christensen Institute. Those of you who know Clay Christensen's work at the Harvard Business School, Clay was on our board for nine years, timed out as a trustee emeritus. Um, and the institute takes his work and applies it in a variety of research settings, and Michelle was part of that. Um, we were able to persuade her to uproot her family and move to California, and she's created this space. These uh, working with the same architects who did the library, which is a great space. Uh, people are starting to discover it. We just cut the ribbon on it not so long ago this summer. Um, so outside groups, internal groups, certainly. Um, and it is sort of our innovation lab version 2.0. So the original innovation lab spun out of College for America and kind of it was, you know, it's great to hit a home run on your first time at bat, but it took everybody that way, and then what, what happened to the innovation lab? So this is our sort of second iteration. And we learned some things, and I think are really, you know, creating this kind of space and the kind of work that Michelle and her team does. So Michelle, do you want to talk a little bit about Sandbox? Hi, everyone. Um, so just to sort of uh, launch from what Paul was talking about, um, this is the Innovation Lab 2.0, and um, the difference here is that instead of becoming the next big thing, the next potentially alternative business model, we are more of an incubator. And so whatever idea is that kind of has some sort of potentially viable business model, we will then push it out into a different group that will implement it. So we, and we will continue to just sort of foster new ideas. Um, can I switch? Paul, can I take that? <laughs> <laughs> Does this work with? Yeah, you want me to start the video? Uh, oh, yes. I just want to show you a quick video. looking at different innovation labs, getting different ideas for spaces, and then there was an RFP, and 
our architects, you know, the architects that we chose, had kind of created this angular layout, and I had the great privilege of working directly with them and designing this entire space and picking out all the fabrics and <laughs> furniture. Um, and what's the best part of this is that people are using the space in the, hope, in the way that we were hoping they would use it. And I'm just going to kind of go through and show what that means. So what is Sandbox? Um, first of all, just the name of the Sandbox Collaborative was a collaborative effort. We uh, created a naming contest that went out to all the faculty and staff. We had over 600 submissions. And we combined these two words from four different submissions. Um, and we love the idea, the playful context of the sandbox, because we really wanted this to be a safe space for play, for experimentation, um, and for iteration. And then the collaborative also really kind of harnessed that idea of what Paul launched last fall, which was the One University Initiative. It's just that we have gotten to this size in terms of growth, that it's wonderful, but we were also starting to lose ties in terms of all of the autonomous growth that was happening, we were going to lose some communication across those three business units. And so part of the effort was to bring the, um, the three units together, and this would be the space that would really help people come together um, and be that kind of meeting house for people to connect and work on the similar challenges together. Often what I was finding as I first came on to the university as I was interviewing people, <coughs> that people were struggling with the same, the same sort of student success challenges. Um, and so we wanted to bring people together, and that was also one of the reasons why we started developing working groups around external partnerships, around academics, around competency-based education. We were seeing it happen across the <coughs> university, but people didn't know who to talk to, and so this is really that space for that kind of um, involvement. So we're obviously, so we are the R&D lab for strategy and innovation for the university as a whole, and what we are is obviously a unique facility where creative meeting space. Um, and the idea here is that we only really have one enclosed room, one enclosed conference room. And people like to book the space, but what we tell people is that you don't necessarily have the space in term for, for confidential or private reasons. You don't want to use the space if you're going to fire someone. <laughs> um, this, is, this is the space where you come to kind of uh, serendipitously meet people and just bump into each other. So there will be people having meetings at the same time. We've, had, we've even had 40 people in this area having a meeting with 40 people in that central area. It's, it's kind of amazing how the acoustics work out in this angular um, uh, you know, um, layout. So we're that facility. We are uh, a facilitator of design thinking sessions. So a lot of people are struggling with a problem. And we just try to bring them back to really identifying what that problem is that they're trying to solve. And giving them techniques to think outside of the box. Um, and sometimes giving them techniques to um, help them build a team, build a stronger team and learn some communication um, work there. Um, so we're a facilitator. We're an incubator. We're an incubator of new ideas, new strategic initiatives. And it's important for um, this space to, to sort of harbor these new ideas, fledgling ideas, and give them the space to to breathe a little bit without being, uh, without seeming threatening potentially to an, another group who might want to just sort of squash it. So the interesting analog here is when Paul was um, sort of designing the, uh, the way in which COCE kind of had its own separate breathing room and how CFA had its own sort of ability to grow on its own without having to fit into the existing business model. This is really, um, he's really used Clayton Christensen's theories of disruption as a playbook for innovation. And that is something that, that, is, that is kind of really integral to fostering something that may have potentially disruptive growth. Um, and so in that same vein, we want to be able to foster new ideas and give it some space um, to, to also fail and so that we can iterate and prototype more and then uh, and, and sort of flesh it out some more. So I'll go through all of these things and give you examples of, of the kinds of ideas that we've been exploring. But we're also a major sort of research support service. So um, we just hired Brian Fleming, who's our new deputy director of research. Um, we have Jackie Lavornia, who's in the back, who's our research assistant. We also have a research fellow who contributes about 10 hours of work a week. But we do a lot of research for Paul and also for the university as a whole. Um, just to give you an example, for instance, um, you know, some of those are around question, you know, Paul might say, can you just kind of look at the competitive landscape around X company, just give me an idea of what's happening there. 
um, or it may be related to our future growth strategy around potential human capital management value chain work. And so we do a lot of work around that. We did some work around mega trends. Um, so as we think about growth initiatives for the university, it's also really important to understand what might happen in the world five to 40 years out. Um, and so part of that was just synthesizing all of the research that already exists around those kinds of mega trends when it comes to climate change, emerging markets, um, and education. Um, and then we're also a forum, and this is something that is um, that we're building with Maria and Lisa Benacci right here, who is our engagement manager. Um, and she's going to be really focused on bringing more events like this into the sandbox, where we will be doing speaker series, we will be um, hosting book clubs around really important topics around education and the future of higher education, things like assessment. Um, those are really important to how we think about how we move forward. Um, and then we're also a repository of information. So all of the projects that we look at, we, have, we, we go through, I think we've probably sussed out about 40 different vendors thus far in the last year. And so part of, um, part of our work is just to also display to the rest of the community, here are the things that we've been working on and here are the people that we're looking at just so, so that the community knows what the Office of the President is, um, is considering and thinking about for the future. Um, and then a lot of those briefs and memos and research pieces that we write will be in there for um, the Board of Trustees or the student leadership to access whenever they need. Um, and we'll also have all of those demos by um, EdTech startups. When they come and do the demo, we record them so that anyone can kind of look at um, and see, see what we've been exploring. So real transparency there. Um, to give you an idea of um, the kinds of research that we've been doing, uh, or the incubator of ideas, because people want to know, like, well, what are you working on? What kind of over-the-horizon innovations are you thinking about? Um, <clears throat> Paul mentioned the Flatiron Schools. So that was a partnership that uh, we really first tried to launch with. Um, first, in, in uh, with regards to, it was in reaction to the federal government um, initiating an experimental science initiative around alternative forms um, of accreditation. And so we were excited about working with them because they're the most interesting fully online coding boot camp. But for those of you who may not be as aware of what this coding phenomenon is, basically you can take a six to 12 week program, pay anywhere between 10 and $20,000, and come out as an eminently hireable developer. You will become a full stack developer running all sorts of programming languages. Um, and it, there's no credential. There's, no, there's nothing really at the end of this, but people are getting hired. And that is what is pretty incredible uh, about these programs. And so we're in the midst of trying to develop a web development certificate that's fully online that people can actually access federal financial aid to. Right now, a lot of these coding boot camps are sort of serving more as finishing schools for very elite uh, wealthy students. And so we want to try to understand how can we get um, the more sort of um, first-gen minority population, uh, people who are not as privileged to be able to access programs like these. So this will be a federally financial aid a bit, um, eligible program, um, and we hope that will be able to help not only our regional community, but across, build corporate sponsorships, corporate sponsorships across the, uh, the U.S. Um, at the same time, we also have a really cool program that we're developing with Ray McNulty, there you go. Um, from the school, our dean of the school of ed, which is a 200 hour fully online professional credit program for teachers. And what it will do is it will enable any teacher who has a grasp of basic algebra to be able to teach a year's worth of coding to any ninth or 12th grader. Um, and so that is um, that's a really exciting project that we're launching very soon, and the White House has even gotten wind of it and kind of wants to announce it in a couple of weeks with their new um, their new commitments for their for Obama's CS for All initiative. So those are kind of the the, the things that we we are exploring. Um, the sorry, the main thing that we try to um, sort of uh, inculcate is this idea that we're not here to solve people's problems, we are a support service to people. So people who don't have the bandwidth to do some research to understand what is going on. Uh, for instance, some folks from the College of Online and Continuing Education came to us and said, can you help us with understanding which universities are doing a good job with online retention? 
can you help us, can you just write up a white paper synthesizing those kinds of best practices? And so that's another thing we're working on for, um, for the university. Another group came to us and said, we need to work on our online education um, processes to make sure that the, the real student is really taking that test at the end so that we're not, um, so that we're being you know, we're guarding against fraud. And so we've done research around all of the different kinds of services available and which ones we might recommend to the university to think about. Um, the real big uh, thing we're trying to build in this physical space is this is the space for all SNU faculty and staff to come together um, and, uh, and have that space to be vulnerable with each other. And so I actually had some UC faculty here saying, oh, is this a, is this a place for students? And we try to uh, make this really that space for faculty and staff. Students have a lot of different maker spaces. They have an innovation lab in the new library. They have a lot of um, spaces to congregate and learning commons, but faculty and staff don't have that kind of space. And it's also uh, valuable for faculty and staff to feel like they can make mistakes in a space and not have not and not be judged at the same time. So all of those whiteboard caves that are that are built in the space are to map out, to to mess up, to redesign, to take a risk. Um, and we really try to um, sort of take into account the sociologist um, Brene Brown's uh, approach to vulnerability, which is that in this hyper uh, digitally connected world, there's still like a very palpable sense of loneliness. Uh, people are not necessarily connected, and so to force those authentic connections, it's really important to have a space like this um, to meet and to connect with one another, and also to admit that you don't know the answer. To not have the answer is actually the starting place for 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 sandbox, and so. Um, as much as people might think that they need to have the answer or pretend like they have the answer, it, um, what Brene Brown talks about is this idea of vulnerability is actually the best way to get to connection, to creativity, and to, to great leadership. And she sort of uses Theodore Roosevelt's um, sort of most famous man in the, man in the arena quote um, and that says, it's not the critic who counts, it's not the man who sits and points out how the doer of deeds could have done things better and how he falls and stumbles. The credit goes to the man in the arena whose face is marred with dust and blood and sweat. But when he's in the arena, at best he wins, and at worst he loses. But when he fails, when he loses, he does so daring greatly. And so that's the ethos of this lab that we're really trying to cultivate, that it is that safe space for experimentation. Um, and this is our mission that you've seen here. Um, I won't go through um, reading it. What I did want to just sort of um, make sure we had enough time is for Paul and I to answer people's questions about um, about the lab. Um, really, uh, if you think about, we, we've kind of divided the, the infrastructure of this lab into sort of operational day-to-day -day, uh, uh, community engagement, and then also the sort of research side of things where we are doing kind of the heads down work and um, in those support services, but it's all for both incremental change in terms of imp improving the import performance within the university. There are a lot of things that people are working on to make things run more smoothly, automatically, seamlessly, and that's what we're here to help them think through. And then we're also here to think about those bigger picture, potentially disruptive, um, alternative business models that we might pursue for the future of the university. So we really have um, two roles, and it's facilitating an internal consultancy for the university, and then also um, making sure that we're making the right kinds of connections and partnerships with industry businesses, associations um, for the future. Because we know as we grow, we can't necessarily continue to do everything ourselves. We will not necessarily teach everything to everyone, um, but it's important to make those strategic partnerships like we have with WPI, with the Flat Iron School, those kinds of things. That is what this hub is for, is to, is to make those connections and to start incubating ideas like those. But I wanted to just sort of make sure you guys had a chance to ask questions to us. No, it's interesting. I was just at a meeting um, <coughs> that had uh, CEOs and CEOs of very large, large employers talking about innovation, and only 6% of them uh, in surveys of CEOs, only 6% of CEOs are happy with their innovation strategies, feel like they're successful. Um, and we've, I think, got a lot of attention for being innovative within our industry in higher ed. 
It was a little bit like being one of the best hockey players in Saudi Arabia. It's nice to get the recognition, but the bar is pretty low. Uh, high, high red is not exactly the hotbed of innovation, but I think um, we have a long tradition of it, and it goes all the way back to the work that Ed did when people weren't talking about continuing at centers and reopen them up when we did international before a lot of people did international. So it's in our DNA. But you know, as we this year approach six hundred and fifty million dollars in size, we see we're on a path to a billion dollars in the next few years. Um, we needed to build a kind of institutional capacity that was much more robust and systematized and programmatic and available to all in a way that was not so true of us when it was a much smaller place and we could kind of do this by the seat of our pants sometimes, which is how I would describe my early years here <laughs> a little bit. So I'm just incredibly happy not only to have Sandbox but to have Michelle leading this way um, because you know we had this sort of really, I think, for me, um, when you're part of any organization, I might think about, you know, there's, sort of, there's organizational war, right? There's the stories, the narrative you tell about your organization. And there are usually sort of key moments in that history. And really, it was just over a year ago, a dinner with our board, which is uh, one of the innovative things we did is we took our board from 26 to 12. This is unheard of in higher ed. Um, and now what we have is a board that functions as thought partners as opposed to <coughs> kind of monitoring, you know, is everything going on okay board? And, we had a dinner, and um, what we said is, you know, we've grown so fast, but we're still organized as if we were running a $90 million organization, which is what we were five years ago, versus at that point, $540 million. So the growth has been like a rocket ship. Um, so what does that mean? Like, how do you think about, how do we have to be different? So it really led to a whole bunch of uh, investments and rethinking and building of sort of centralized capacity. So there's now, we don't have the slide for it, but we've actually really formalized our innovation con concept actually, to yeah, initiative. Yeah, that slide, yeah. I think it's a great slide. I think we've worked really hard at this. And the other thing that happens is I think we bring, there's a virtuous cycle that happens. So when you get good, really good people, no really good people, and we get sort of more and more folks. So uh, right now, when somebody's in the concept stage, we actually have a place to go for that work, which is to come to Michelle and to the Sandbox staff and Ryan and, uh, and, and the folks at uh, Lisa and others that are here, to so help us think through this. And as that, and we go from concept to having something, we really feel like it's starting to get traction and get some shape. We can go then to initiative, um, the sort of decision to kick this up, and then it goes over to uh, Nick Aramedi, who's our deputy director of strategy, and Nick sort of becomes a project manager for that and brings in the people from the business units that take an idea and a concept and really help move it to business plan. And then sort of another decision says, is this a plan we believe in? Do we have conviction? Do we want to uh, devote resources to it? And then we can go to implementation. And that implementation could be to kick it over to a business unit that says, yeah, we got it, thank you, you did all the hard work for us, and we're off and running. Or it could be that we start a whole new line of business, which we've done in the case of Motivus. This is a process that is not in place at that time. But it is, you know, so um, this is a kind of purposeful thinking through how innovation happens, um, how research and R&D happens, in a way that we didn't have before, but I think it's illustrative and indicative of what, how we're trying to operate as a mature organization that can't sort of be, you know, you have to be, you're, di you're existentially different in the world at different phases in your growth and different sizes. Um, so I really like the work that we've, we've done here. And these things can be iterative, right? So this concept goes up here, they start to do the business plan and go, oh my God, there's a big chunk of this we didn't get right yet. Let's kick it back for more work. It could be a little stage here. It could go to the leadership team that says, we like this initiative a lot, but we need to know more about A, B, or C. Let's kick it back up to these guys. So it kind of cycles back through. And all of this has to come back to, does this thing fit within our broader strategic framework, right? We begin the larger picture of what we're doing. And sometimes <coughs> concepts come out of strategy. Sometimes concepts happen op opportunistically, and then we see if they still fit our strategy. And then you sort of see what kind of discipline you have about saying, yes, we'll rethink our strategy. Our Great idea, but it's not what we're about, and let's sort of put this aside. So I'm really pleased with this kind of work, and this is indicative of the team's uh, thinking. This is not mine. This is the team really coming forward with this concept. Um, questions about any of this? It tickles me that. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. I know you've had certain expectations coming in here, not knowing what would happen, it's still early on, but have there been any surprises that you were really excited to go on? 
in terms of how the space is being used, mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, that's been really neat to see. We actually are going to uh, redesign a few spaces um, and repaint certain spaces um, just because we see how people have been using it. Um, but in terms of real surprises, I think uh, I've just been surprised that it's working in terms of the way mm -hmm. people are using the space and um, fine with the sort of noise level uh, when, when there are multiple groups in the space. Um, we're, we're just really excited to get more folks involved. Like I think particularly at the UC, um, I think more of the faculty and staff there don't know that this exists for them. It's, it's kind of a, it's sort of shrouded in mystery and so part of our job over the next few months is to really clarify that this space is for everyone at SNU, um, for the faculty and staff at SNU. So that is, that's kind of our main goal there. Uh, no huge surprises. Only good ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But now I'm inspired to label that one closed room the fire room. <laughs> 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 I'm going to be in the fire room. Everyone declines their meetings to that. Not around that day. Sorry, man. Right. Can you talk about how you envision the community being connected to this? Because certainly yeah, the curiosity and interest, and there have been some outside groups that have been able to. Yes, so in terms of usage of the space, we are working with property services and Lisa is really developing a, 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 a defined plan on how we kind of rent out the space to different groups because we know that there are a lot of community-based organizations and companies that want to take advantage of the space and we want to enable that kind of connection. Um, in terms of facilitation, it really, um, it really depends on what, what the needs are. So we actually had um, Governor Maggie Hassan's uh, task force on STEM education come, and they wanted to rethink K through 12 STEM education, and they wanted to build a new kind of academy. Um, and so we really helped them uh, break down an entire day's worth of a workshop where they had invited 40 different leaders from the Northeast who were specialized in STEM uh, to think about how we might think about a state system that could enable uh, a new way of approaching STEM education. And so we can do those kinds of really, um, uh, you know, thoughtfully, um, thoughtful facilitations, but usually that requires some sort of major connection to the university. So uh, Susan Dexter, who's our math professor at UC, she was on that task force. And so that, um, those kinds of facilitations make sense that we would want to help um, there. It really just kind of depends on the context. We, we kind of take in anyone's sort of um, questions and then we try to see what, what we can do to support their work. Um, but certainly the space is available um, for usage. It just depends on the connection to the university in terms of rental price that kind of So I just would finish by tying this back to, I think, why we exist uh, as an organization. And delighted that Anne and Ed are here because I think this, again, is in our DNA. But we often say we're a place for students for whom college is not a guarantee. It could be not a guarantee because they don't have resources. It could be a guarantee because life has dealt them a bad deal. It could be an adult who tried it, didn't, wasn't, wasn't ready, like get in the way in some fashion. Now they're stuck. They're 30 years old. They're kind of take care of their family, they're maybe they're in a dead-end job, but now they're coming back to complete their education. Could be an international student who's had to rally every bit of support from mom, dad, aunts, and uncles to get to America to work on that degree um, and, and sort of forge a new life for them. However it is, that's really still our commitment, and um, we really have a, you know, we think hard about access, and a lot of our innovation work is how do we make education, put education in the reach of people for whom it's increasingly out of reach. So, um, you know, my own family immigrated. I was the first kid in my family to go to college. Um, I did not have a mountain of debt. I could work construction every summer and mostly pay off my, my, my college bills. Um, that version of the American dream is increasingly out of reach. And the reality is that only 9% of our poorest kids, the bottom 20th percentile in the socioeconomic class, are able to go to college and complete. It's far, far better to be a rich, stupid kid than to be a really smart, poor kid in America. Um, we've got this backwards now, and um, we're really trying to find ways to address that issue. 
Uh, we have enormous challenges in our workforce. We've got almost 40 million Americans with some credits, no degree, and a lot of debt. That's a terrible trifecta. Um, employers are worried about the ability to get people they need that would train them in the right ways. One of the reasons coding boot camps have risen and have become so popular is that we're going to need 1.4 million web uh, full stack web developers and high red will only produce about 400,000 of that number. So there's enormous need in that area. Talk to Dai and talk to any of the folks locally and ask them about their technology needs. So there are enormous needs, enormous problems facing the nation. I think if what, however you feel politically about this election, what we realize is that a lot of people feel like they're being left behind and that the game is rigged against them. And the best tool that I know to sort of move the dial on that issue is education. We say about ourselves that we relentlessly challenge the status quo. Right? That's what we do. We, there are no sacred cows about how we get people a good, high quality, affordable education. And Sandbox plays an important role and help us collectively think through that. So it's, it's really important work for us. And when I think, you know, all the way back to the beginnings of this place and to the work that the Shapiro's did, it really was about certain populations that weren't traditionally being served by mainstream high red at the time. So it's very much rooted in the origins of this place and I'm really proud of it. So, but thank you all for making time and coming and there's more food. And there's plenty more food. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Just a couple of quick notes as we close up. Um, the next business in the year series is in Rye at September. September 14th, right? Uh, and uh, then we have the next, exactly one month after that, we start with Homecoming uh, on October 14th through that weekend. And that has grown into just, uh, how many of you have been to Homecoming, please? Oh, awesome, some hands. Uh, that has grown. Uh, Chris and your team have really taken that to a very new level. Uh, and uh, it's nicely celebrated now that we have the green space and all the campus, not a parking lot anymore. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, very, very festive uh, event as well. So uh, I hope, uh, I'll, I'll end as I say, I hope you guys have caught some of our, our version of open, opening day here uh, in the energy of higher ed. Uh, it's a very exciting uh, time of year for us. I hope this space uh, has inspired some of your own uh, thinking. Uh, and uh, again, uh, to, to Mike Bellwether Community Credit, thank you so much for your sponsorship and helping make this series and this, this kind of thing possible. It's also a, kind of a, a, a Good housekeeping stamp of approval when we have that kind of sponsorship. So, thank you for that. Uh, and to the Letty Group for future uh, our coming uh, business indicator series in the course. So, happy day. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.